Thank you. Wow, it's going to be a little bit of an unusual twist of where I'm going this morning. You know, Forrest Gump said, life is like a box of chocolates. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. Preaching is like a mixed bag of peanuts with a cashew in the bottom. And like every time I get a pack of peanuts, I go like, I got to, I, I, or excuse me, mixed nuts rather. I got to go through the pecans, the peanuts, I don't, I, you know, to get to the cashews. So, so today is going to be that mixed bag, but God has deposited a cashew in the bottom of my spirit. And you may have to put up with a few peanuts as we go through here. I just got to get the bag open and uh, get to the bottom of things. So, uh, so in saying that, I just want to say I, I, would like to, I would like to speak prophetically as a father in some sense to you and give you a heart talk, a prophetic heart talk and, uh, as a father speaking. And I'm um, not particularly interested in teaching or, or maybe prophesying right now. I just want to talk from my heart and uh, have a heartfelt talk about some things. And, um, and, and, um, <clears throat> and in doing that, I, I believe that there's something that God's dropped in my heart for you that you will uh, radically uh, shift and recalibrate some of the things you're going through right now uh, because it is a time for a shift. We're in an inflection point and a super shift is coming. We need to be ready and our hearts need to be prepared for that. So I like it uh, when uh, Chris talked a little bit about holding pattern because that's what I'm going to be talking about, the holding pattern that we're in and how to uh, get out of that. And uh, so... Um, but I just want to say about this, the time that we're in, it's a crazy time. It is like, my, there's crosswinds and, there, and there's turbulence and, and there's this, this uh, give and take and anti and matter and, and matter and, and negative and positive and going in circles. It just, just seems like a crazy time. And I, I know when President uh, uh, Trump's uh, general, attorney general, I think, or no, vice president wrote the book, One Darn Thing After Another, I thought, that's a sermon right there. You know, just it's been like one darn thing after another, after a darn thing after another. And it's just been a struggle for a lot of us, and it's been interesting. But it's not without cause, it's not without purpose, and it's not without an end resolve that we're going to look back and say, wow, did we make it through that time? And I'm going to tell you about some of that, what that means. So I want to talk to you about that. But, but, but before, before I say this, say it is the turbulence is, is strong. I woke up with a vision about uh, a month ago, uh, a night vision, and I saw trees in, in the forest. And uh, it was heavenly trees, but it was trees. And, you know, Isaiah says that we are tri trees of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. And I saw this great crosswinds coming across, and the, and the trees were blowing from one, bending over from one side to the next side. And there was this near, near confusion of direction, and there was this terrible storm that was impacting the trees, and the limbs were going crazy. And I thought, that's exactly where we're at. We're, we're, you know, as trees of righteousness, there's these crosswinds, there's this turbulence, there's this uncertainty that's overtaking us during this time, and we're in the eye of a storm. We're in this crazy, crazy place. So I was thinking about that, and something the Lord had spoken to me uh, a long time ago about a holding pattern, and what, what does that uh, mean? You know, and I've flown a lot in my life, tons, and, and, um, and, um, um, and I've been through a lot of uh, turbulence and uh, going places, and I've been through a lot of holding patterns, numerous holding patterns where um, I was not able to, um, uh, to get to my destination or I was late to my destination. And so let me just say this, you know, up front. But what is a holding pattern? You know, um, a holding pattern is a place, you know, where uh, uh, as far as aeronautical, it's described as this, is flying in circles over a destination waiting for permission to land. That ought to tell you something. It's a state of waiting where activity and progress is suspended for an amount of time to recalibrate a reentry to a place you had not determined to go in the first place. This is for the church down the street. I, 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 maybe, I don't know. I don't know if you got that. And so I, so I want to talk you through that, what it means that, you know, uh, uh, things have not yet been determined, some of the turbulence and some of the headwinds that are against us, what that means. What do you do? What do you do in a holding pattern? But here's the upside down of this. Usually you give text first and scripture first, and um, out of that you extrapolate, extrapolate uh, into sermon. Well, I'm going to do the complete opposite. You're not getting the text to the end. 
So I want to talk you through something in the text, and the, I'm going to paraphrase and give you a prayer phrase of Acts 6, 7, and 8 of the great holding pattern they were in and the turbulence and how that God did something incredible there and uh, in that particular place and brought a super shift and changed the trajectory of the New Testament church. And there was a, a, an amazing change that happened that changed everything, but it was not without heartache. It was not without turbulence. It was not without headwinds. It was not without directionless feelings. And it was a realignment because with every reassignment in God, there's always a realignment. We want a reassignment and we're going to get it but God is patient to give us a time to realign for the right airport, for the reassignment, for the right time so that we can make the landing rightly. And so if you're in this room tonight, God's doing a new thing and God's doing something different and I like that. I, I'm allergic to sameness. I'm allergic to the same old same thing. I'm in love with different. I'm in love with surprise. He's Jehovah, Jehovah surprise. It's just that's who he is. And I love Jehovah surprise. And so um, that's where we're at. And, and I, I, I'm a little bit, a little bit, as, a little bit as I can get excited about it at this age of my life. You know, uh, Paul came used to say, we're glad you're here today. He said, I'm glad to be anywhere today. And so I sort of feel like that. So I, I'm just glad that even though in the turbulence time that here I am. So things are not to be determined because I believe the Sanhedrin of heaven or the course of heaven are in session and there's a mapping out of times and seasons, inflection points and trajectory and, 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 and headwinds and all that's going on. There's a lot of stuff and a lot of pieces moving around and the council in heaven is in session right now because I woke up to that a few times. I've been there in the Sanhedrin in the spirit. I know what goes on there and uh, there is a council happening right now about what's happening in this earth and how you and I play into that. So, having said that, what do you do when you're in the holding pattern? Let me just give you, again, a few things. And there are three or four things I want to give you, then I'm going to uh, parse through and, and paraphrase uh, Acts 6, 7, and 8 just from memory and show you one of the greatest holding patterns and the greatest transitions that the church experiences, a first century church, that we are going to experience a piece of that, and it's going to be wonderful. Just right now, you got to buck it up. So here it is. So first thing in a holding pattern, what would you do? The first thing in a holding pattern when they say you no longer can make your destination because of the headwinds and there's turbulence and you're bouncing up and down, number one, and this is for you and I, don't panic. Do not panic. We are faced with a crisis of uncertainties. And this crisis of uncertainties is really a tipping point for panic. And I have really fought that in the last few years and, and other aspects of panic and things that go with uncertainties. And it has been a, really a test for me. And um, so the scripture says, you know, that God has not given us a spirit of fear or a spirit of panic or a spirit of dread, one translation said, but a power and love and a sound mind. And I know that, but nevertheless, it takes encouragement. I want to encourage you. I want to tell you how it encouraged me. And I want to give you a couple of Bob Jones calls, or at least one that he gave me before the Lord took him home. And it so helped me, because he knew what was coming. He knew this season. He knew this season was coming when Bob was sick. And, um, <clears throat> and, um, and it was like, you know, it was sort of things were in the balances. Is he going to make it? Is he going to not make it? And um, so, I don't know, some months before he, he, the Lord took him home, uh, my phone, my, my cell phone rings. And... Uh, and Bob rarely, you know, I see him in conferences, I see him all the time, do ministry together, it's great. I call him, and, you know, but he never usually calls me. I called him for a week, he wasn't an answer, and when I finally get him, I say, Bob, you didn't answer, I called you every week. He said, that's because I unplugged my phone from the wall, I didn't want to talk to anyone. And I said, well, Bob, he, I said, Bob, that's, he said, well, if you had listened to the Lord, you'd know when to plug the phone into the wall. But anyway, that, that's Bob, and we love Bob for that, because I love that. So the phone rings, and it's, he go, it, it's Bob, Larry. And I go, whoa, this, is, this must be something. And so Bob said to, the, to Laura, my wife, Laura, and uh, we love him. I love him dearly. I miss him dearly. And so does Laura. And he said to, uh, to me, he said, I just need a call to tell you something. And he said, I just want to tell you that I love you and Lori. Like you're, you're like my family. I love you like family. I knew what that meant. Bob was leaving. 
And he said, I, I love you, and I, I, I've always loved you and Laura, and, and um, I, I just need to say some things to you. And he said to me, there are three spirits that are coming up on the earth in the next few years, in the next year or so. And the three spirits are a spirit of panic, a spirit of fear, and a spirit of anxiety. And they're demonically inspired. And many people are not going to make it through that time because of those spirits. But Larry, you have to. You cannot do panic, anxiety, and, and fear. And then he continued to say to me, he said, and I want to encourage you that during this time, you have to fight for your life. You have to fight to live. This is a season where a lot of people are going to be taken out. Ministries are going to be taken out. Things are going to be taken out. This was, what, 2014, 15, 16? I can't remember. And uh, because I was going through a very sick time, and it got sicker after that. And he says, there's some things I need to say to you. You've got to stay alive. You've got to fight to stay alive, Larry, to finish what God has called you to do. You have to fight. And I was tired of fighting. I've been with every sickness in the world since I was, since I was, five years old. So my life has been a fight to stay alive and to fight in the health arena. And he says, you have to fight to stay alive. And he says, and you've always loved people, but it's going to be challenged. You have to stay alive and you have to never stop loving people. He said, if you don't do those, then you'll miss what's coming. And you have to fight you have to let go of panic, anxiety, and fear. You have to fight to stay alive, and you have to love like you have never loved before because love never fails. And he goes, well, anyway, goodbye. Click, hung up the phone. And I started weeping. I told Laura, oh, Bob's going home. He just said goodbye. And it was like my heart. I said, Lord, no, no, I know. I mean, if there's any deficit we have in the Christian community, it is, it is not enough father's. I had not enough fathers in the faith. And I love that because we got great preachers and we've got, we got great teachers, we've got great prophetic miracle workers, and that's all wonderful. That's great and that's wonderful. But there's something about a fathering anointing. There's something about a father that is not powerful in that sense, but powerful in believing in you and loving you and encouraging you to fight and to stay with the game. I mean, just, I just love that. And so I've seen that. Come. I don't know if you have. And I uh, flatlined after that, during that. I remember Bob's word coming up when they were waking me up, the doctors around me, and I heard his words again. You, Larry, you've got to fight to finish your course. You've got to fight. And I want to say something. I'm talking to you. I just want to talk to you. I want to heart talk to you as a father. Whatever you're going through, whatever's ailing you, whatever's against you, what demonic spirit's trying to take you out, you've got to fight. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. You've got to war. You can't give up. You can't give up. You can't just stop. You can't just say, I'm done. I mean, you've got to, you've got to rise to the level of courage that will carry you through this time because the inflection point is coming and the shift is coming. You've got to outdo and outlive the demonic spirit that's trying to take you out. And that's national, globally, as sort of things that are happening. Matter of fact, just a couple of scriptures about that. Uh, but don't, first of all, don't let anxiety rule your state of mind. Because what you feel is not what is real. What is real is what God has told you. What is real is what God has spoken over you. And although it is real, your feelings are antithetical to that. And your feelings tell you that what you feeling is what's real, but it is not. We do not live by feelings. We live by the Word of God, and we live by the Spirit of God. And although they are in conflict with each other, what you feel, I don't care what it is. Well, if you feel depression, the scripture, that's not what's real. Because, listen, the, 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 you have to be instrument rated. In other words, you have to understand the word of God and know, read the instrument panel. You can't trust when you're flying in this spirit room. You can't trust your sight. You can't trust your feeling in this storm, in this turbulence. You have to be instrument rated. And if you have a Bible, what your feelings say is, I am a loser. But your instruments say, I am greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You have to be, you will die. You will die if you're not instrument rated in this next move of God. 
you will crash because you will follow your feelings to the bottom of an ocean somewhere because in feelings your, your equilibrium is turned upside down during times of storms and turbulence and only a good pilot that survives is one who disregards his feelings and is instrument rated to fly according to the instruments and the instrument rated manual is the word of God and what you feel is not what is real but what the word of God says is what it is that it is is true and it is the truth and we have to lean into not what we feel but what we know that we know that we know that we know that he is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he would ever change his mind about what he has said to you and so I want to encourage you with that so don't panic in this holding pattern wow this place where activity and progression is suspended and you have this sense of wow what is going on i'm losing altitude guard your words proverbs says in 18:21, the power of life and death is in your tongue so listen during this time i've learned that denial helps I live in a constant state of denial. There's a conflict of realities that works in my orbit, in my spiritual and, and my ecostructure uh, of my spirit, my body, my thinking mind. There's a conflict of, 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 of realities. And I have developed a kingdom mindset, and that means I deny, like Jesus and I, when Satan tempted him and said, said, you know, if you be this, you be, he denied that and he flew by instruments. He says, no, it is written by the word of my instrument panel says it is written. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so it is a critical time. And during this time, the Lord awakened me uh, uh, one night and uh, put this thought in my time. I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about Paul. And what the Apostle Paul, what an amazing apostle who had an amazing uh, 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 foundational ministry, apostolic. You know, he was the he was uh, you know architect of theology and this gifts of the Spirit in the first century church. The fledgling, fledgling, fledgling church, fledgling church was was his was his little bird, and, and it's just that. But man, he did he have to endure some things. I mean, this guy who was called with this great purpose found himself stripped of his skin off of his back and a holding pattern in times of great stress and crosswinds and and demonic oppression in the first century church, and he was bound and thrown into prison in the middle of the night beaten like you would not believe and he sat there and he was sitting by the way the prisons in those days in 2000 years didn't have a his and hers bathroom I mean he was sitting on the floor and and and, and urine and, and others and the place stunk it was horrible it was like but it was it was, it was terrible and I thought about that and I thought about what he did and I want to tell you what you do. I want to tell you if that's where you're at. If you feel like you're in the prison uh, and, and that you've been beaten and you're not going to know if you're going to make it through this time, what's happening to me when all else fails, sing. When all else fails, sing. When all else fails, smile. When all else fails, Paul, can you imagine what an amazing spiritual character he had in this, in this place? He knew what he was called to do, but it looked like circumstances and a holding pattern and crosswinds had kept him, I were taking him to a place wh to where he would not be able to finish that. But what did he do in the dark of night? What should we do in the dark of night? What should we do in this little transitional spot where we're waiting for God to take us a new place? What we do, no matter what prison that we're in, we lift our hands in the middle of the night, no matter what we feel like, no matter what sickness is in your life, no matter what demonic oppression is coming at you, no matter how you feel, no matter how bad you want to quit. And I don't only want to quit. I've turned in my resignation so many times, they don't even look at it anymore. <laughs> I told Bob once, I said, Bob, uh, Jones, I said, Bob, uh, I said, I, I quit. He goes, you can't quit. I go, why? He said, because you were fired so long ago that you don't even remember it. I go, okay, that, never mind. Don't explain that to me, Bob. In other words, in other words your works were fired. You know, don't worry about that. So anyway, that's, that, that, that didn't help me much at the time. But anyway, I got it later. So, so Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas is in the bottom. And some of you are in your Paul and Silas syndrome in the, in, the, in the middle of the night in a prison. And there's something amazing on the other side of that that you got to get to. But you're in this holding pattern. You're in this place where you're being tormented, where there's a spirit of torment, where you've been, where you've been demeaned, embarrassed, and the whole bit. Listen, when all else fails in that time, 
You know, Paul didn't say, I quit, that's done. I'm going to go ahead and shoot myself and my ministry is over. He lifted up his voice and he began to sing in the dark as little birds sing in the storm in the night. I've heard them in the, sto- in, in the midnight. I've heard birds in a bush begin to sing because they always know that morning is coming. And I want to encourage you with that. When all else fails, take courage. Take courage and let your heart be encouraged that it's not over till it's over. That although... The enemy comes, I remember a song, hit me with your best shot, and I've sang that to the enemy before. Go ahead, hit me with your best shot, fire away. Because it doesn't matter, because I'm here forever and you're not. So go ahead, take your best shot at me, take your best shot at me, because the higher one has purposed my life and has purposed my destiny, and I'm here by the graces and the good graces of, the, of, of God. He's a father, and a father goes to all extremes for his sons and daughters to make sure they get through these rough places in their life and he doesn't condemn them and demean them for them. he encourages them and holds them tight and, and, and pushes them forward into their destiny and the bottom line is you get through it because you have someone of a higher level and a higher value that believes in you someone believes in you and that is all of heaven Every one of your ancestors or friends that are there now are making intercession for you. Jesus forever makes intercession for you. And he's touched with the feeling of your infirmity. And you're not going to lose in this thing because you have a higher power making intercession for you. And that higher power is not dumb with you. That higher power believes in you. He believes in the salvation that he's put in your spirit and the beauty of God that he has has sent into your life and the works of God, the investments that he's made in your life. So I should probably end with that because I've got to hurry. Too long with it. But let me just say one more. During this time before, the time before I saw Bob, I was really, I was quitting. And I thought I was going to die. I really did thought I was going to, I didn't think I'd ever live. I've never, I'm always dying. Somebody said, ever since I've known you, Larry, you've been dying. Would you hurry up and do it or get out of the way or do something? So I don't know. But, 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 but Bob comes up to me and he puts his finger in my chest and does that. He goes, you think God's a bad banker, don't you? I go, here we go with the Bobism. I have to have three, three, three theologians interpret what he's about to tell me, but it's all right. He says, you think God's a bad banker, don't you? I said, what? He said, you think God's a bad banker, don't you? I said, would you explain it to me? He said, well, he's not. He's a good banker. He's invested in your life since you were a little boy. He's invested over and over and over and over. He's worked with you. He said, by the way, he could be doing this stuff. He's busy up there. He don't have to invest in you. And if you think that after the... 50 years at that time that God's invested in your life. At the end of your life, he's just going to just let go of the investment and lose investment. He goes, no, he's going to get his money's worth out of you. (laughs) And and so he said, you need to buck it up and you need to quit thinking that God's a bad banker. He's not. He knows where to invest and he's going to get his money's worth. So you just need to keep going. So I'm telling some of you, quit thinking God's a bad banker. Listen, he is busy. He spent a lot of time investing in you and he's not a God that wastes his time. So you just need to hang on and keep hanging on and keep believing until that investment comes home. You've got to. Okay, number one. Number two, hurry. You've got to stay in contact with the control power, tower. Number one, in a holding pattern, which I've been in many, and you have too, you, the, the pilot stays in contact with the control tower. He has to. So I want to say to you, during this time, during this season that we're in, this no man's space land kind of that's, that we found ourselves in, and this turbulence, we have to reestablish, if you have not, contact to get through this with the control tower. Okay. Especially on final approach. And we're on final approach. We're months away, if not, a, if it may be a year, so at least months or years from final approach. And it is necessary to stay in contact with the control tower. Not any small talk. But Paul said, pray in the spirit because you don't know what you need. Begin to talk to the control tower. And you, I, here's the way I pray to the living. I go, I go, Houston. I got a problem. God, you got to help me. Help me navigate and get navigate and get this thing down to where it needs to go. 
And not only do you have to, not, not, now you're not supposed to preach at the control power, tower, you're supposed to talk to the control tower, get your direction, and listen and obey the commands that come from the control tower. And by the way, can I, because, because it was said in Genesis that this is what happened during Genesis' demise, uh, in the Israel's demise, when they were in bondage and slavery, it said this, and they began to talk. They began to say, Houston, we got a problem down here. And it was, that's my context. It was put in the Hebrew context in Genesis. In the Old Testament, they said, and their cry and their distress went out before the Lord. And God heard their cry as they cried out to him. And God says, I've heard it. Control Tower says, I'm going to come down and I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to bring them into final approach, into a right place, and a realignment, and a place. And it says this, I'm going to come deliver them. And God did and God brought them to a new place and to a new land and destroyed the enemies that were oppressing them and delivered them from this crazy holding pattern they were in and they became a nation and a powerful nation because God heard their cry. God needs to hear your cry. You need to talk to the control tower. And not only that, and one more, we'll move on. You need to listen to the control tower. But let me, can I help you with listening? There's, there's different kinds of listening. Little Samuel was lying in his bed with Eli, serving Eli, and the Lord awakened him in the night and, uh, and, uh, 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 and said uh, to him, you know, uh, you know, anyway, Samuel replies, speak, Lord, remember that, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. Now, this is, this is quite a nuance. I want to give it to you. Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. Now, we, a lot of us hear from God. There's one thing to hear, and there's one thing to obey what you've heard. I think that's probably our biggest disease as a community of believers in the earth now is we want to hear, we want revelation, we want, but I don't know how much of it is really followed through or obeyed or lived out. We just, we're, we're information gluttons. And Samuel is saying, speak, Lord, because he gives him, uh, he's speaking to the control tower. And the Lord is telling him what's about to happen with Samuel in the next inflection point and the next kingdom that's coming and all that. And, and this is why he says, speak for, for your, your servant hears. And if you read some of the expanded uh, Bibles and you get into the Hebrew, there, there was, there was, that word is different than just hears, to hear with the ear. It was this, your servant hears with the intent to obey what you have said. Why is God's cop speaking to me? Because you don't have the intent to obey. Why, why I'm not hearing anything. Maybe you don't have the intent to obey. Here's why. He's not talking because he doesn't like us. He's talking because he loves us with all his heart. But he knows there's a law that says if God speaks to you and you disobey that, disobedience is, is a sin of witchcraft and you incur judgment, God would rather never talk to you to see you fall into the judgment of disobedience. And we think God's mad at us when it's his love that stops speaking to us. So we have to not only speak to the control tower, we have to listen. We have to have the intent to obey nine degrees right. When we can't see, we don't know what's going on. We have to trust the command tower. We have to trust that if we're going to have this altern, uh, alternate landing. And not a lot of small talk helps either. <laughs> so, so it's critical. So anyway, number three, as I'm getting to the, the cashew, there's an incoming cashew that's coming, and it's for you this morning, and for this reason, if anything came out here, it's for this, what I'm going to happen in the last 10% of what I'm doing. Stay in your assigned seat, please. First Peter puts it like this, I can put this kind of, as each one of you has been given a gift, a charisma gift, even so minister someone else, I mean, excuse me, even so minister that same gift that God has given you. I am so done with that, that, that sense that I fought in my life like gifts of God, as even as God has given gifts, he says, whatever, you, he's not called you to minister someone else's gift. You have a seat, you have an assigned seat, you got that assigned seat you got on a plane, quit trying to always work it up to first class. Stay in your seat, shut up, believe that's where God has put you. And that's what it's God's to me. But again, Peter says, as many as of you as has received the gift, even so, minister another person's gift that you like, minister something you want. No, minister that same gift to the church of Jesus Christ. 
Paul puts it clear, I think, in, to me in 2 Corinthians 10, 14. He said, I press myself not, and I do not stretch myself, if I can put it in contemporary terms, beyond my measure. And the word there, measure, is the Greek word metron, where we get our word meter, or to meter, to measure thing. And it's a spirit of influence. And Paul was saying, even as an apostle, I stay in my spirit of influence. I stay in the boundaries of my calling, and I'm not piggybacking on someone else's calling, someone else's seat, someone else's anointing. I have a seat that God assigned in me, and I'm going to be true to sit in that seat till this thing is over. Well, that, I don't know if that went over, but how about this one? We live in a world where we don't understand metron. We don't understand spheres of influence. We don't understand where God has given us authority. We think we have authority over the whole world. A lot of ministries think the authority stretches as long as their, fair, as their air ticket. There's certain places God will not let me go. There's certain places that I thrive in. There's certain places that is outside the sphere of my influence because it's someone else's influence. We really have to learn that. And I've had to learn that on the plane because I've had the tendency on a plane to run to first class and get somewhere under, under the seat or, you know, change seats. So it's like maybe when we crash, this part won't break apart. Trust God that whatever assignment is given you, whatever calling, whatever gift you get, is being given you for the better of the church, and you need to stay true to that gifting. You don't need, listen, I don't want someone else's gift. I want my gift. And if it's not the greatest gift in the world, a, 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 how do I say it? I'd rather, I'd rather be a bad copy of me than a great copy of you. I would rather be a voice than someone else's echo. I'd rather be authentically me than make believe someone else. I am not pursuing anybody's gifting. I'm not pursuing anybody's anointing. I don't want someone to pass their anointing on to me. I want an anointing I've never had ever been poured out on anyone because God, the God of difference and uniqueness and has designed something for me that fits me, that's for me, that no one else can do because of my personality, my uniqueness, same with you. And Paul talks about it as being the body of Christ. To each one he has given different gifts so that we can build up the body. Same, I am absolutely aggravated at the spirit of sameness in the church. Be yourself for a change. Be different for a change. I love different. I don't mean different in the, in the context that you aggravate everybody, make everybody mad, but at least be unique. And I've overworked that, so let me get on past that. This is where I want to start, and we'll stop here in a minute. Be open in a, in a holding pattern. You have to be open to an alternative landing. This is where it's going to get tricky, and by the end, you're either going to like me or wish you hadn't have came. Come. Be open to an alternative landing. And I'll get to that in a minute. Let me give you a story. So, the late 80s, I don't know where I'm at, somewhere in the world, the nation, but I'm flying back and my cross, my, my transfer from East Coast to West Coast was Denver. I was living in LA at the time, LAX, Orange County was my destination. I don't know if you've ever thrown through Denver, but if you don't like wind and turbulence, you're probably the wrong metron for you. And, I mean, I can be asleep. I can be sound asleep and fly over Denver without any turbulence, and I know when I'm over Denver because I can feel it in my spirit. Now, I love Denver. I'm talking about the atmosphere is kind of crazy there. It's just the winds and turbulence. So I'm flying back, and we're to land in Denver. And the, the um, pilot comes on and, uh, and says, uh, brace yourself, get your seatbelts on, and by the way, if you don't have your seatbelt on, you know what that is, the belt of truth, the Ephesians said, but you don't have your seatbelt on, you'll be tossed around a lot during this transition. But it says, put your seatbelt on, get to, we're about to experience some turbulence. Well, there's one thing to experience turbulence and the next thing for all hell to break loose on a plane. I mean, stuff was flying in the air. We're going down and I heard people saying, we're gonna die, and I go, shut up. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. It was, it, was, it was absolutely insane. The crosswinds were taking the plane this way and that way. And I'm thinking, wow, Jesus, I want to see you, but not right now. <laughs> I, prefer, I prefer we connect in Orange County. But, and, and I'm getting a little, little bit panicky. 
you know, with that. And, uh, and this is what he said. And he said this. He said, I'm sorry we will not make Denver because of circumstances beyond our control. We're going to have to recalibrate. We're going to have to realign, and we're going to Colorado Springs. I said, I don't know anybody in Colorado Springs. Don't want to go to Colorado Springs, whatever. Colorado Springs was plan B. Plan A was not working for me. But plan B was unknown to me. The pilot knew there had to be an alternative landing or we were going to die. Now, let me parse this through with you and then give you the scriptures. The perfect will of God in your life is not always what you think you know. The perfect will of God in your life and God's mystery of transition is sometimes a change in your final approach or your destination. I stop telling God where I'm going or when I'm going or when I think I should going. And I think, well, if I do, I know he's going to change it because he's the guy in the control tower. And so as we're going in, I realized, wow, we land in Colorado Springs and we're there overnight. I didn't want to be there, all, but I, I know I'm going to, but something miraculous happened to that. It was a God moment. It was amazing what happened. I didn't plan on it at all. But an alternative landing, plan B superseded plan A in my life that day. And if you can hear me, okay. If you can't, okay, but I want you to hear this. Sometimes plan B has greater impact in your life than plan A that you've been waiting for. Bunch of you, including me, are about ready to find out what plan B is in our life. And sometimes plan B is God because plan B didn't work and God has such resources of destiny in his life. He can go all the way to Z, X, and the alphabet, and you're still in the good will of God. By the way, do you know there are three wills of God? There's the good, the excellent, and the perfect, the perfect will of God. I thought, man, we got a choice. But why do we always go for like the perfect will? It's got to be the perfect God. I mean, listen, it's got to be perfect. I don't know anybody that's walked in the perfect will of God. That's why God said good and acceptable. I mean, sometimes just the good. Listen, if you can just deal with the good will of God, you're doing good. Sometimes, I mean, the good, you, there's a choice. You know, there's a choice. You know, there's a good will. There's a, if you have children, you know what I mean. There's a perfect trajectory in life you want for them and vision for them. But sometimes it's just whatever. That was good, boy. I mean, that's, that's good enough for you. I mean, a good will is good. Accept I mean, he's a good, he's a father. He understands. He's not demanding perfection out of us and a perfect will of God and a strenuous kind of uh, 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 discipline in life. If you don't do it, it's not perfect. If it's not perfect, you know, it's not going to work. No, sometimes good is better than the perfect that you're too immature to handle. And God loves to put us in the good, the acceptable, and the perfect. Romans 12, 2. Okay, any of that I said was peanuts. <laughs> and it was just Larry talking. It was Forrest Gump's box of chocolates. Now I heard the Lord say, run, Forrest, run. Okay. <laughs> so, so here's, here's, here's what I want to say to you that changed my life. And it's going to change your life. When I say it to you, you probably have never thought of this before. And to do that, I, Acts 6, 7, and 8, there's a thread of continuity of destiny and transition in the first century church that is absolutely mind-blowingly revealing about the way that God not only works but recalibrates things and, and creates realignments for reassignments and takes us to different places when it looks like what is happening is not God when in fact God is in charge of the whole thing. Because not only does God have good, acceptable, and perfect in his per, uh, bag, and A to Z, he's got a billion choices, and any of them he chooses to make, he can make them better than any you could ever imagine in your life. You, God's never without a plan. Okay, can I, can I just give you a paraphrase? Acts 7, 8, and 9. There's a thread of continuity. There's, there's a development, an inflection point that happens that takes the, the first century church to a whole new place to spread the gospel. And that's where we're at. Acts 7 
is a documentation of the New Testament church and after Jesus' death and resurrection, and there was this coalescing around a few, uh, a few of the disciples, and they gathered together in Jerusalem, and some of them are apostles. And the church, the fledgling church begins, not a lot of structure going on there, and the apostles were actually not just apostling, they were serving tables, they were having to settle disputes among the people in there, and, and you know, the church, you know, they were doing church. But one of them had some wisdom and thought, you know, this is not right. We need to probably select some deacons, or they call them deacons labor, one who attend or attendants and servants. We need to select some men full of good faith and good report. We need to select some men so that we can back up as leadership of the New Testament church and build the architect of this thing and pray and get God's mind. And so they give ourselves to the word of God in prayer. Okay, you know that one, Acts 7. And so they select seven men, and the first two men is who I'm going to talk to you about before I end. And it is Stephen and a man named Philip. And they stick, both of them are good men. Both of them are wonderful men. Philip you don't hear much of right there, but Stephen is happy to do it because he knows his ministry is what? Working with the women, waiting on tables, taking care of the arguments, feeding them whatever they're eating right there, Elijah burgers. I don't know what they're having back there, uh, something. Uh, hummus, uh, I don't know, but feeding and, and he is working. And as he's being faithful to serve, as he's deaconing in his spot, he's not looking for anything great at all. That's just he's in his assigned seat. He's been assigned a seat. And in that assigned seat, out of him, without him trying to begin to flow this love, and it says, and miracles and healings begin to happen as he's serving as a deacon, greater than the apostles were doing. And he was like being raised up as the golden boy, the first century church. I mean, man, his ministry, if I was there, I'd think, man, we're going to put this guy. He's going, to be on, he's going to be on first century TBN. I mean, if that, if not that, he's going to be global. We're going global with this guy. This guy, my gosh, look at him. Signs and wonders, miracles are healing while he's serving bread. And so he's the golden boy of the New Testament church. All the hopes, I'm sure, were probably in, like this guy's like, amazing. He's going to be Wow. It's like, well, we got to lean this guy. I mean, God, he's, he's going to put him into apostleship later. Or, you know, I mean, like, he's going to change the world. I mean, like, he's, he's setting the template, the example for what it means to serve and not only just serve in your place as a deacon, but also excel in the gifts of the Spirit and the love of God he had for the people and to keep them from arguing. Stephen was this amazing composite of spirit and word and servanthood. He was amazing. He was like their hero. Acts 8. He decided to preach to the religious crowd. And Acts 8 is nothing but a sermon. He preaches all day long, and every once in a while he slips in a rebuke, and he infuriates the religious sect. Do you remember that? He infuriates them, and he scolds them in a kind way. And at the end, they're so mad at him that they take him, and they take him away, and they take him outside the city, and they stone him to death. This is the promise of the New Testament church coming to an end through a religious spirit, a demonic attack on his life. You would think, wow, he was plan A. That was, wow, plan, what, what, what happened? I mean, like, phew, have you ever had a Stephen moment in your life where it looked like you were excelling and a religious spirit coming just flattens you on the ground, took away from you? So here he is being stoned to death, and at the end of his life, he lifts up his hands and voice. He says, God, Lord, into your hands, you know, I commend my spirit. You know, he, he, and he died. Now, get this, between chapter 8 and chapter 9, who's the other guy? Philip. So Philip and the other disciples, uh, apostles and uh, the, other, uh, the other elders of the church, and this is what the Scripture says, were standing around the grave of Steve, and they were weeping on what should have been. They were mourning on what looked like the best God had to offer for that season. They were mourning over a man who was without any guile, who had this amazing gift, and he was their golden boy. He was the poster child for the first century church of healing and serving and miracles. And as they're standing there, there was Philip standing there, and they're crying. Philip is standing at the grave of Stephen. And the scripture bleeds over in chapter 8 now and says, and they, but Philip went 
down to Samaria. Rest the apostles are there crying and weeping, mourning over what should have happened. Looks like this revival's come to an end. This thing's not going to work. And Philip decides, you know what? He didn't ask them to go. He didn't say, can I have your permission to go? He just said, I'm not doing this. I'm not standing at the grave of failure and weeping over something. I like this, King James says. So he just went. He didn't get permission. He just went. He went down to Samaria. And here's the way Acts 8 begins. It says, and then they were all scattered, began to scatter abroad, preaching the word, the word, the Logos. They were teaching the word. But Philip goes to Samaria and begins to teach not just the word or the word, Christos or Christ to them, which is the anointing. The other apostles were spreading the word. Philip walks away from a dead Stephen, who was, who was his brother, who was the hope of the church, who was like, what has happened? The thing's in confusion. This is not what we expected. And Philip walks away without permission, just walks away and says, I'm going to do something. Philip walks down to Samaria and begins to preach Christ, and they heard him. All of a sudden, lame begin to be healed. All of a sudden, miracles begin to happen. All of a sudden, the city is turned upside down. And the scripture said, and there was great joy in that city. It was a major move of God, such a major move of God that, that, that spread the gospel beyond Jerusalem into Samaria that they, the apostles sent other apostles down there to figure out what Philip was doing because it was new, it was different. It's like, how did we get here? And out of that came the expansion of the New Testament church through that era, through Philip, who refused to stand at the grave of a failed promise and never do nothing again. Let me pull it, let me say it better. I can say it better than that. I want to make it personal. I came here just to make this personal because this is where all, all of us, every one of us have dead Stevens in our life. Every person in this building has some dead statement, some promise, something that should have been that did not come. Something that was beautiful, something that was wonderful, something you thought or maybe that God had promised you, something about your hopes, your visions, your anointing, your calling, it didn't come to pass. And you, like Larry, now you're 73 and thought, hmm, heaven better hurry. Because I thought everything that the Lord showed me in vision and visitations as a, as, a, as a kid and as in my 20s would happen before I was 30. And I somehow miscalculated that because I'm dealing with a God who doesn't have a clock. So, so many of you, many of you in this room, during this place that you're at, have dead Stevens in your life and you're looking at a new re-establishment and a reboot of what God wants you to do but there's got to be something you got to do that realigns you with that and that's what Philip did in other words let me say it again what he did was and what I want to encourage you as a father if your Stephen has died Stop crying. Stop beating yourself up. Try trying to figure out what you did wrong and why somebody else didn't do something right to help you do something right. There's nothing to blame. Stop blaming God. Stop blaming the devil. Get, in, get into a higher vision of that. And refuse to let the death of a promise or the death of a destiny thought you're going to have keep you from a higher level of something that you had no understanding about what's going to happen. Let me, okay, let me put two things. At the grave of ever Stephen, God, which is plan A, God has Philip, plan B, waiting. At the grave of every Stephen in your life, there's a Philip waiting to take you to Samaria to turn it upside down. I don't care what happened yesterday. I don't care how you fail yourself. I don't care what went crazy. I don't care how your gift went crazy. I don't care how you sinned. I don't care. But at the death of every Stephen in your life, God is faithful to have a Philip who refuses to stand there and weep over what should have been, could have been, had have been in your life. It is not over. It is not over when a Philip is your friend. And by the way, 
No one saw it coming. So in this next season that you and I are going, in this new season you're beginning, what you think should have happened that didn't happen is probably not going to happen. It's all right. It's all right. And whatever pain that's been in your life, whatever distress that's been in your life, go ahead and bury that, Stephen, if there's no resurrection, and lean into that, Philip. God is never without a plan, ever, in your life. He is never without the resources, the mentality, and the anointing to shift you into another place that is greater than that. And I, I, I will say two things that's going to be, theologians are going to kill me if they hear this, but I'm going to say it anyway because that's what I do for a living is aggravate theologians. So, and I love him. I want to be one, but I never could be. I figured out they didn't want me. I was a qualified in seminary just because I had a GED. But anyway, that's a whole other deal. <laughs> I mean, I consider it God's educational, you know, doma. But uh, a GED from Arkansas, to add to that. <laughs> so I'm not their first pick. I was God's first pick, but not the theologian's first pick. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh. If I can say this, I will get theologically parsed for this part, but God's just not the God of plan A or the perfect. God's the God of plan B. And he's so amazing, he can make plan B three times greater than plan A. And you're like, your Stephen was plan A. Philip was plan B. Plan B did greater than plan. Plan B spread the gospel through all of that region. Plan A was hosted in the conference in Jerusalem and in the church in Jerusalem. Now, here's the part I get in trouble with. Adam, in Genesis 1, when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, it was the purpose of God. God, help me say this right was plan A. Things went wrong in the earth. Rebellion, sin. A second Adam come, he was plan B. Jesus was plan B. Oh God, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I know I am, but it sort of excites me at this age. Because I'm looking for trouble. Because I'm bored. Jesus, of course, always from the beginning, you know what I mean by that. I mean, in, in just more of a common man term, he really, I mean, the first Adam was plan A. And when it fell through, well, the Lord didn't go, man, what am I going to do? God said, what am I going to do now? <laughs> no, we going to create the second Adam. Eve was plan A. The church, which is the Eve of the second Adam, is plan B. Plan A was Genesis 1, plan B was Acts. So I, I just want to encourage you. I want, I, first of all, I want to tell you, shut up. <laughs> shut up slapping yourself. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you shut up. But I was just at a grocery store, pastor in L.A., and going to my way to Sunday morning church. And there's a lady that couldn't speak English very well at a dollar store. I stopped by there. Saw by the dollar store to pick something up, and she's on the phone talking. She goes, I tell my, you know, and she's talking, I say, uh, and she said, I'm telling you right now, my boyfriend ever call me shut up again, I'll nail him. He don't call, nobody call me shut up. And, it's kind of, and I'm going, ma'am, she goes, I, she goes, anyway, he said shut up to me. You don't call me shut up, and I ain't going to do shut up. And I said, ma'am, is this a dollar store? And she goes, yes. I said, well, I just picked this, I want to buy it, but it says $1.99, and you, this is a dollar store. And she said, ha. Huh. I said, what's up? She said, everything in this store is 99 cents, except the stuff that's not 99 cents. Don't you ever call me shut up ever again. Like, okay, anyway, I just had to go there just for fun. So don't call me shut up. Don't call you shut up. I mean, like, come on. It's like, give yourself a break. Get, get a life. <laughs> Be flexible. I tell you, the greatest thing God ever said to me is, Larry, I'm going to give you the 11th commandment. Thou shalt be flexible. (laughs) 
We're about to experience plan B. We're about, you are about, I don't care where you're at, I don't care what vision has failed in your life or what promise has failed, what ministry, what's happening to you, God's a father. And he never leaves his children without a plan, without a purpose, without an investment, without a future. And this thing that we're going into, although there's a holding pattern, it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere, it's coming to an end and we're gonna find an alternative landing site and we're gonna go, wow! I thought plan A was great, plan B is like, don't call me shut up, it's like wow! <laughs> and I thought this morning, I said, Lord, I'm supposed to do I thought I was supposed to say something more brilliant than this. And the Lord, he jokes me, says, you don't have the capacity for that today. So I go, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I called Jack Deere. He's a friend of mine, the, the theologian. I was like, call Jack Deere, see what he says about it. But then I thought, no, I better not do that. <laughs> okay, I got it. I'm, I'm ending here. I just, you got to maximize the moment that you're in and quit living at the grave of the Stevens in your life that have hurt you. And I'm looking as I woke up this morning. I didn't plan on doing this. Because anybody in their right mind wouldn't plan on doing this. I didn't plan on doing this. And as I saw you this morning that I was going to be speaking to, I could see the crowd. And I saw the broken hearts. I saw the failed visions and the discouragement during this transitional time in my father's heart. I said, God, how can, I, how can I encourage them? How can I say to them, God loves you unconditionally. He loves you. He'd shift, every, he'd shift every airport in the world for you to have the right landing. He'll shift everything in your life. He is, going, he is going to will and do his good pleasure in you no matter what happens. God is for you. He never loses. He's going to make it happen in your life. You just need to shut up. And you need to stop saying, stop saying, God, what's going on in my life? And say, God, what amazing thing is about to happen after this headwinds is all through in my life. It is not over. It is not over for anyone. And you're not going to die. I didn't say you're not going to be praying to, but, and I'll be honest, I've said the last few years, Lord, I am, I'm ready to go home. I just don't have anything else. I, I'm, I think I'm done. I think I've, I really, I really mean that. I mean, I love people, but I'm kind of done. And that's when the Lord reminded me of this. You hadn't even got to plan B, Larry. Would you shut up? You know? <laughs> okay, plan A's done in my life. And now I'm starting to go, well, plan B might be interesting. <laughs> when the turbulence is over, I'm having a new landing site. I don't know what it looks like. My life's going to change. And the things I love about God, we think he's the same. That's why the same, the same bother me. He's a linear God. God is light. How fast does light travel? 186,000 miles per second, and you're waiting on God? So God's linear from glory to glory. He said he's transformed us by his spirit from glory to glory to glory to glory into the likeness of Christ from glory to glory. So we're on a linear 186,000 miles per second light God path that's taken us to where no man has ever gone before. As we behold him in his face, we are transformed in that linear process into his image. Listen, Jesus on Calvary, that was a Stephen moment for him. And I don't think he was that greatly excited. He wept, sweated drops of blood said, Lord, if you can let this happen, like plan A, what is going on here? Went to his best friend and said, ask for prayer from his disciple. Will you please pray for me? And at the end said, Lord, I don't get what, why have you forsaken plan A? Because God had a higher purpose in plan B. For he who ascended is he who, I mean, descended is he who ascended and gave gifts unto man and became pastor of the New Testament church and uh, gosh there's amazing stuff for us so I want to encourage you it's not over it's not over give yourself a break as I saw you this morning I saw some of you discouraged so discouraged some of you praying take me home and I'll end with this one 
Another Bob story. Is that all right? There's another one that the theologians will probably revoke my GED. I wanted to go to seminary, but the Lord clearly told me he was going to take me to the school of Holy Spirit, Hard Knocks. That school lasts longer than a seminary. <laughs> I'm still in it. <laughs> so after Bob had called me, I'm going to end with the Bob, started with Bob, after Bob Jones, and I, I miss him. I miss, I miss my father, my spirit. I just, there's something about fathers that cut to the heart of all the stuff and get to the issue of care and love and encouragement. That's why this Paul calls him Abba Father. So you, Bob passes away after giving me these words. I don't know if it was a year and a year and a half later, all my health issues, I'd just taken, gotten off of decades of conference ministry and tenor ministry and and I'm going to get into it but the Lord made it clear to me that I was to lie down in green pastures and take a rest and put me pastor in a small Baptist church and I'm going like that's not even alphabet Lord what's up but I began to get sick again and I couldn't travel I couldn't fly and uh, I've been there eight years now hardly do conferences anymore I refused all of them. I was going to refuse this one until the Holy Spirit said to me, her name is Laura in my house. <laughs> Honey, you need to go because I, I, you need to go. I can't fly. And so I said, well, I can't fly. They go, well, you can drive. And I go, somebody always smart there. But I'm here for that. But anyway, so. So I'm, I'm so sick. I flatlined on the opera in 2016, I think. I think Bob had been gone, I don't know how long, he'd been gone a year or two, maybe 2017 during that time. I'm so sick, even pastor the church, I can't even get in my pulpit for six months. My associate pastor is uh, pastoring. And there's a dentist of medicine in me. It's a Baptist church and who's no so longer, we're Baptist apostles now, but I thought, so the first associate pastor I chose was a woman. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Deal with that. Anyway, she's amazing. Anyway, she still is. And she's there this day. So, but it, I'm done. People have to carry my water. I'm so sick. I know I'm just not just going to make it. Three times in my life, I have been caught up into the heavens and to hear what the Sanhedrin, if you understand what I mean, the Sanhedrin were discussing and making decisions and counseling on things on the earth. And so I knew, I just knew, I could, I'm not going to make it. I, I don't think I wanted to. I'm done. I, I, as the Lord said to me once, Larry, you're fine. If you want to finish, it's good. You've, you've totally gone way beyond your potential up here, and we're proud of you. And I still don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. But anyway, <laughs> he said, you have amazed us here. And uh, I wake up at 11 o'clock at night either 2016 or 17 and I'm caught up and I can I'm, I, I know I'm in heaven I know I'm around the Sanhedrin Sanhedrin is the council of elders in heaven and is there, I've been there before and I've heard them arguing you know, not arguing but contending with each other about making a decision about that's what the Sanhedrin did about things and as they're making and talking about it I realize they're talking about me if, they want, if they're to bring me home or leave me on the earth. And as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking, good. May, come on, guys. You know, I'm ready. I, I'm just tired. I'm done. I don't know what else to do. And um, as I'm listening to them talking, I hear a voice rise above their voices. And it was Bob Jones's voice. I go, are you kidding me? Bob is in the council of Sanhedrin. Well, why not? <laughs> Absolutely. And they were saying he should come. They were, they were and Bob raised his voice in the spirit realm above their voices and said, no, the earth needs him. They need who he is. And he began to argue my case 
and the Sanhedrin about who should go. There's some other, they were just condemned. Some of them did pass away. So who's going to stay on earth and who's going to go to, God's going to take with them, who to leave. And Bob argued my case. And he, of course, Sanhedrin's never saved because he's going to win every time. And he won that. And when I fell back into my bed, I realized I don't know what I need to do. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on. But I guess I'm not going to die. So I'm going to have to do something. And uh, so I'm still here. And so I'm ending with this. And I'm still here. I've got three minutes, two minutes. I'm still here. But I'm here for one thing, really. Done my ministry. Had great success. Done a lot of things. Been everywhere. Was the old song, I've been everywhere, man. Anyway, that's, sorry. It's, everything's a song to me. I'm a musician. I, I've done it all. I, I've, I've gone way beyond my potential ever. God's used me more than I thought I could ever be used, you know, whatsoever. But I'm here for one reason, to encourage, to encourage the brokenhearted, to comfort all those that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy, the garment of praise with the spirit of heaviness to encourage you don't give up don't give up and don't let the death of your Stephen don't die and bury yourself with your hopes and dreams with Stephen there's a Philip waiting at your grave and in six months many of you are going to find yourself in a Philip mode in this and I'm speaking metaphorically in Samaria turning cities upside down for the gospel of Jesus Christ There are people in this room who, have, who are tormented with taking their lives. There are people in this room who are asking God to take them home. I've done that one. I know that one. And, and, and you can't. What you carry is unique and authentic, every one of you. You're gifting the seat you're in. And for what God is about to do, we need your weight. The earth needs your weight in the spirit. You see, we measure people on earth. We measure their God weighs people. It's not about measurement. It's about the weightiness of your spirit, what you carry. Diamonds, real diamonds, are, are valued by their weight and their imperfections. Fake diamonds are determined by their imperfections. They have no flaws. Real diamonds are distinguished by their weight and the flaws of age and time in their time. So no matter what you've been through, God needs you for what's coming. Don't give up. Don't give up. I wish, and I don't have time, I wish I could go and kiss every one of you on the forehead and give you a Father's blessing, but I'm going to end with this, a Father's blessing. God, I ask for encouragement, and ever embattled human being in this room. Romans says that every one of us, before we were born, God knew us. David said he formed us in our mother's womb and he put our joints together. He had thoughts of us. We, me, every person in this room was a dream in God's heart and of, of, of billions of years ago. You dreamed about every one of us before we were born. You predestined our horizon, our place on this earth. And Lord, I speak into that destiny, that predestination, that love of God. That I, I, I speak into every person here who is about to become the dream of God come true in every aspect of their life. God programmed into your being, into your existence, a uniqueness that no one else carries. And if you leave this earth or if you quit or if you give up, there's a piece of the tapestry and the mosaic and the beautiful picture of the puzzle of heaven that will be incomplete without your peace. It's called the body of Christ and the members of the body of Christ. You have, you have to stay here. So I give you a blessing. I bless you. I bless you to be everything God has called you to be. And if I was your father, every person in this room, I don't care what you've been through, I would be so stinking proud of you. 
just to even get through this place we call life and this season that we call turmoil we're having. And if I have that sense, what do you think the Heavenly Father has in his heart? He loves us, Abba Father. Abba Father, he loves us unconditionally. For God so loved us, he actually gave the dearest thing in his life, his son, uh, to us. So I want to encourage you with the endless love of God. And I want to encourage you, don't let go until that predestination, that event horizon that God predetermined in your life when he saw you in your mother's womb, when he forms you, he, he determined an event horizon, a place in this horizo, this, this horizon, this place in the earth for you to go to from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. He determined that. You are a product of a dream of God come true. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what's happened to you. I really could care less about what's happened to you. I don't care about who you are. I care about whose you are. Amen. You're his. And he told a woman with the issue of blood, remember that? This is not original for me. A friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine said this to me. Her, she's, I love her so much. She said, when he healed the woman. With this, she touched the hem of his garment and her blood you know, dried up. He said to her daughter, and it was about that. It was about touching. And the bottom line is, he called her daughter. And if you're in this room, you're his daughter because it's not about what you have done or not done. It's not about who you are. It's about whose you are. You're his. You're his. And you're his. And you're his. All of us are his. And if you love your children, how much more do you think the Lord ever lives to make intercession and embrace us because of the pains in our life. And he said to her, and I want to say this to you, and I promise I will quit. Woman, thou art made whole. Not because of what you've done or who you are or how you failed or how, ter or how well you've done. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. He paid a great price for you. Don't throw that away. And so I want to encourage you, Lord, blessing, may your blessing, 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 blessing be upon this congregation, be upon the people that are in this room. May the overwhelming love of God settle on them. May a father's embrace settle upon them and encourage them during this season. In Jesus' name. Promise I'll do one thing. I get don't go anywhere to come here, but every any woman in this room that has never had their father or their father die without telling them they love them, I just want you to be bold and stand straight up. Just stand up. That you can't remember your father telling you that they love you. And when people are honest, and I've done this before, sometimes sixty seven percent of women in the room will stand up. Their father never told them he loved them. Just keep going. There's a few of you. Stand up if your father. You know what, guys? Go ahead and stand up with them. Stand up if your father, before he passed away, had never said, you're a good son, you're a good daughter, I love you. I want you to stand up. Look, at, is this, this is an indictment against the era we live in. Look at this. Keep standing up. This is some of the brokenness, some of the pain you feel is the lack of, of affection and covering and a sense of purpose that you never received. Some of them didn't do it because they were mean or mad or didn't like you. They just didn't know how. They didn't know how. Before my mom and dad passed away, my mom was dying of rheumatoid arthritis. Dad had getting into Alzheimer's. They couldn't get out of bed. They lay in bed. And I, I said, that's it. They're going to die in a year. I'm going home. I, had a, I canceled a conference in Jakarta, Indonesia. Amazing. Because I wanted to go home. I wanted to go home because I said, I will not live this crazy life without the hand of my mother and father and a blessing on me. And I went home and knelt on my knees in front of their beds and I said, Mom, Dad, I know you love me, but I want you to bless me. I can't live this life without a father's blessing, without a mother's blessing and mom's frail little hands with arthritis. My dad can really put them 
put them on my head and said, I bless my son, Lord, our son, and we bless him to be what you've called him to be. And that has been 15 years ago. And to this day, a week, not a week goes by, I don't feel that hand on my forehead. It gives me courage that I've been blessed and I carry a blessing. And so we want to bless you. You that are around them, if you want to just reach out and just touch them. I don't have the time for that. We just reach out and touch them. And there's three people with the middle name Ann's right here. Ann, who's Ann? Put, put your hand high. Uh, uh, where, where are you at? Where are you at? Real quick. Get their hand up so you can get to those because there's something special about that. I don't have time for that. There, there's one. There's two. Okay, good. So, very now we bless. So, here we go. Father, I thank you for the enduring love of God. Lord, you love the world that you gave and you so love. You said your nickname is love, for God is love. And we thank you for the courageous, wonderful, beautiful love of God. Thank you for the kindness of God and how you have conspired from Genesis to Revelation to love us. And you have gone to prepare a place for us as a parent would do, that where we and you are, we would be also. But in this interim space, we need your blessing. And we bless every person. I give you, sir, ma'am, I give you a father's blessing. I say, may he bless you coming in. May he bless you going out. May he bless the hurts and the bumps and the bruises in your life. May he embrace you with an embrace, a divine embrace, and never let go in your life. May you feel secure and confident. May you feel like you're worthy and worth something more than people have told you are. May all your fail failures melt away under the divine embrace of a father who cares less about your failures. He cares about the one who died for you to cover those failures in your life. And he cares about your growth and he cares about your rising up in his blessing and becoming the son and daughter he's called you to be. And Lord, I bless them, and I bless them, I bless them, I bless you daughters, I bless you sons, and may you never go to sleep lonely again. May you feel the embrace of a father, God, who loves you more than you can ever imagine. And may it give you courage to be whom God has called you to be. And I don't care if you're at plan M, N, Z, or P in your life. There's yet another alphabet number, a letter for you. And there's yet opportunity in front of you. So, Lord, bless them in Jesus' name. I'm done. Hug them. Somebody hug, hug one of those. Just reach over. Just hug them. Tell somebody you love them.